welcome to Ozark First Assembly. We're so glad you're here with us today. If this is your first time, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to be with us. We hope you feel at home here today. We want to let you know about a few things coming up here at OFA. Lifeline Ministry Partners reach out to our shut-ins and widows. We are still in need of a few more partners willing to help just by texting, calling, or sending cards. If you would like to sign up, please see Jeannie Emmerich or Julie Watley. There will be a baby shower for Samantha Presswood on January 24th at 6.30 p.m. If anyone would like to help with this, please see Diane Tharp. During this year's 21-day fast, we are reading and praying through the Book of Acts as a church. If you haven't joined us, we would love for you to read with us. Booklets are still available at the Welcome Center and digital copies are available on the church website. Let's join together and believe God for the impossible in 2022. Thursday, January 20th, Fervent Women's Ministry will meet in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. for a prayer and worship night. Please join us as we seek God in 2022. We have several baby showers coming up in the next few months. If you would like to help with these, please see Lisa Boatwright. Winter Women's Bible Study, Six Women and Jesus' Genealogy will begin Thursday, February 3rd. Jennifer Presley will be teaching the daytime study at 9.30 and Julie Watley will be teaching the 6 p.m. class. Please order your book as soon as possible. Sign up at the Welcome Center so we know who is coming. Gulf Coast Women's Conference will be February 17th through 19th in Fairhope, Alabama. Ladies, please sign up at the Welcome Center and pay a deposit of $35 no later than February 1st. Turn in money to Julie Watley or put an offering marked GCWC. Parents, 456 Camp is February 11th through 13th for 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. The cost is $110. If your child would like to attend, you can register online at adcag.org. Please see Pastor Matt for more details. Be sure to check us out on our website and Facebook for more announcements and to stay better connected. Again, thanks so much for being with us today. We're expecting a great service. Psalm 91. I love this psalm. We quote this psalm so much about God's protection. There's two distinct verses I want us to look at before we go to the Lord in worship. That's verses 9 and verse 14. David writes this, for you have made the Lord, talking to us, our refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Verse 14, because we have loved him, therefore I will deliver him. This is God speaking. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. You know, there is a cause and effect statement here in these verses. Because we, because I, let's make it personal this morning. Because I make God my dwelling place. Because I set my desire, my love upon Him. And I set my life's course to intimately know His name. What did God promise here? He promised that He will cover me. He will cover you. He will cover us. His truth will protect us, will protect you, will protect me. And I will call upon him and he will answer us. He will deliver us and he will give us good life. The question is, is do we believe this? Come on, our walk with God is all about faith. Amen? Do we believe this? If we believe this, how can we not lift our voices, our hearts, every ounce of our being to God in worship. So in faith, as we believe what the Scripture says, can we stand together this morning? And can we lift our hearts and offer our lives before the, this, the Lord this morning? Father, we thank you. Lord, we worship, we adore, we exalt you. We thank you, God, that, Lord, you have enabled us to make you our dwelling place that you are our refuge, you the most high God. And Lord, you have, because we have set our love upon you, Lord, you will deliver us. You will set us securely on high. God, you will set us upon that rock that is higher than us. And Lord, in this knowledge, this great knowledge, we lift our voices, Lord, in total surrender and worship to your greatness and to your majesty. Receive our praise, Lord, as we would give it today in spirit and in truth. 
be honored as we worship you, O Lord. Because of his goodness, he meets our every need. If you're here this morning, you have a need. You just need the body to agree with you because we know that there is power and agreement. It's not the words we pray, it's the name we pray in, the name we pray to. There is power in the agreement as we agree in Jesus' name. If you have a need this morning, whether you're in the balcony, whether you're on the floor, you want to just lift your hand and say, I would like the body to gather around and agree with me this morning. Is there anyone? Don't want to go any further in the service. There's anybody here that needs prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you. Because your goodness, Lord, as David says, your mercies, they're new every morning. Lord, we thank you, God. We worship you for your care and your love that you bestow on us as your children. Lord, receive, oh, our devotion as we would give it wholeheartedly. Lord, lead us today as we continue, Lord, in a time in your word. Oh, give us ears to hear, give us hearts to receive, as the word always calls for a response of faith. Lord, may we clearly hear the word call to our hearts for that response of faith, so that the word may be living, it may be powerful to us, in us, as well as through us, for your glory and the advancement of your will. We ask it. And we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and everyone in agreement. Just say amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. We take our Bibles this morning and turn together to the gospel account of Mark. Mark 13, or Mark 12, excuse me. Mark chapter 12. I don't know what happened. Well, I know what happened. I just don't know how it happened. Um, whether it was my glitch or whether it was a glitch on you version, but the reason you couldn't see notes on Wednesday is it was saved as a draft instead of being published, and I do apologize for that, but it is available for you on you version this morning. Mark chapter 12, can we begin reading together with verse 28? One of the scribes came and heard them arguing. What I mean by that, or what the scripture means by that, Jesus wasn't arguing, he was just answering their questions. And you had Pharisees that had come and asked questions. And recognizing that he, the scribe, that Jesus had answered the Pharisees well, the scribe asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to Jesus, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that God is one, and there is no one else besides Him. And to love Him with all your heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and To love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And notice what Jesus replies. When Jesus saw that the scribe had answered intelligently or rightly, he said to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Lord, lead us in your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
from the text that we've read this morning, if you look at the time frame and just kind of understand when this moment took place, it's Tuesday before Jesus' crucifixion on Friday. And Jesus is in the temple courts and he is questioned by the religious leaders of Israel. And these men are attempting to trip Jesus up in his answers to their questions so that they can have a reason or have grounds of accusation against him from the law. We go back and we look in Mark 11 verses 27 In 33, we find that these individuals asked Jesus, what was the source of his authority? What gave him the right to teach and to declare as he did? We find in Mark 12, verses 13 through 17, that they asked him whether taxes should be paid to Caesar. And then before we Our text from this morning, we find in verses 23 through 27 in Mark 12, that they even asked the pointless question regarding the wife who had seven husbands, and these husbands died in succession until the wife was left as a widow, and they said, whose wife will she be in heaven? Now as we read these questions and understand the nature of them, I think that we can all agree that these individuals were not looking for answers. They were looking for opportunity to accuse. And in a very underhanded way, they attempted to trip Jesus up in his words to find reason to bring a case against him. They needed legal grounds from the law. Because they desired to get rid of him and his message because it was, it was messing up the thing they had going. And that's their only reason for probing Jesus with all of these questions. Not for answers, but for a legal reason to get rid of him. But now the scribe comes. And in verse 23, we find that the scribe seems to be asking an honest question. Different from the Pharisees, but an honest question. He's an expert in the law. And he's listened to Jesus deflect these trap questions that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, had posed to him. And at the same time, He heard Jesus give amazingly accurate answers. And unlike the others before him, this man asks the essential question. The essential question was not about taxes. The essential question was not about whose wife a widow would be in the resurrection. The essential question was literally this... What is life about? What is life about? The essential question is the why question of life. It's the why of what we do in life and and how we do life. In other words, it's the basic principles by which we live. The core values that guide our lives on this journey. And just like most things in life, in order to arrive at the right answer, we must first ask the right question. The essential question the scribe asked was verse 28. What commandment is the foremost of all? What commandment is the foremost of all? The ESV, the, inter, the English Standard Version, puts it this way. Which commandment is the most important of all? And I want us to consider this anew and afresh this morning. I realize that 
Most everyone, if not everyone, has read this passage. I realize that most everyone, if not everyone, has heard this passage preached on. But it is my heart this morning, from the heart of God, that we look to this essential question in freshness this morning and allow the Lord to stir us and draw us to Him. As we are praying and believing in these 21 days of fasting and prayer in the book of Acts as we're reading together and focusing together and asking the Lord to allow this time to be something that would be, a, that would be foundational. It would thrust us into this new year. It would thrust us into this new season for Ozark first. And I know that I've been preaching from Acts since we started the fast. In fact, before we started the fast, but as I was looking and I could never get settled, and the Lord just stirred my heart in this way toward this scripture. And again, let's look at it with fresh eyes. Although we've read it before, although we've heard it before, can we with fresh eyes, can we with a fresh mind, can we with a fresh heart look and allow the Lord to lead us and direct us in this passage again? The essential question. The essential question is which commandment is the most important? In other words, what is the foundation of our life with God? Why do we serve Him? The why defines what we do. The why defines how we do it. And it's foundational for our lives. Now you guys know I love history. I threw that in there. I love history. And it's important. History is important because if we don't understand history, we're liable to do what? Repeat it. And history, when we look to the Word of God and the culture and the people that it was written to, it's important for us to understand what was going on because it can't mean today what it didn't mean then. Because God's Word is transcendent. It spans time because it's eternal. So let's dig a little bit on why, and I'm hurrying. This scribe asked this question. Did you know that the rabbis counted 613 individual statutes in the law? 613 I have a problem with 10. And from the chuckles, so do you. 613 individual statutes in the law. And what we know is the Old Testament. And of those, we find that there are 365 that are negative. And what I mean by that is if you do this, there's death. There's consequences. And there's 248 that are positive. If you do this, there's life. And there was an ongoing debate among the rabbis, among the scribes, among the teachers of the law to differentiate between what is considered as heavy, if you'll remember from Wednesday night. What is considered as heavy or great and what is considered as light or smaller of the commandments. And the rabbis who made attempts, they also made attempts to formulate great principles from which the rest of the law could be deduced. And with all of this, oh come on, can you see why the people were burdened down? Why Jesus said he looked and instead of finding a people at rest in their heavenly father, he found a people who were worn down and who were trapped by the law because of the way the Pharisees, because of the way the religious leaders were going about things. The people were worn, they were burdened. Instead of being enlightened and given life. And it's in this context that this scribe, this teacher of the law, asked the question of Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? That kind of brings new light to it, doesn't it? It did for me. And Jesus' answer came 
for what is known as the Shema. The Shema. Which were first introduced to that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. But the Shema we get from verse 29 and verse 30 of Mark 12. Again, read it with me. The foremost is, this is what Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. What we have to understand is every Jewish child is taught this response from the earliest age of learning. It was repeated twice a day, once in the morning and then in the evening. Plus, it included the duty of obedience to the other commandments given by God. They recited this once in the morning and in the evening and kept the rest of the commandments. It is, we could say, the creed of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It is their creed, we could say. Shema is a Hebrew word which means to hear, to listen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hang with me this morning. In other words, God is not divided. God is not divided. There aren't many varieties of avenues to God that contradict one another. No matter what man comes up with and says that we as believers, when we talk about Allah or we talk about these other individuals, it's such a humanistic form of religion. There are many different ways to God. No, the Word of God says, God Himself says, there is one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. One way. God is one. There is not a variety of avenues to God that contradict one another because He is one. And as Christians, we understand the oneness of God as the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, not three. Three distinct persons of the Godhead while completely one in purpose and function. Now, why do we speak to that? Why is that important? It's important because this part of the Shema which means to listen, to hear, it affirms two things about God. Number one, the unity of God, the Lord is one, and the covenant relationship of God to his people. The Lord is one, but the Lord is our God. Is that not what scripture says? The Shema affirms that God is one, but it also affirms the covenant relationship of God with his people. Hang with me. Hang with me. How easy. How easy is it to be distracted? I'm sitting at my desk studying and doing different things. Are you guys like me, squirrel? Some of you laugh because you know exactly what I'm saying. Squirrel, (laughs) I'm talking to Jennifer and she hates it. (laughs) I got three different things going on in my mind while she's trying to talk to me. And she wants to, I know what she wants to do. She has never done it yet. Reach up, grab me by the ears. I have to call O. (laughs) Reach up, grab me by the ears, and pull me close and say, listen to me. (laughs) But how easy can it be to be distracted and become so busy with, quote, unquote, religious things? Things become religious even in the church when God is separated from them. We can do good things, but they become religious things when God is not a part of it. In fact, I've heard it stated by Our former general superintendent, Dr. George Wood, he said it this way, the main things as Christians are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And Jesus indicates for us in a very clear and plain way in verse 30, what are the main thing, or I should say this, what is the main thing for us as believers? When we look at verse 30, we find that the words your And all are both used at least three times. Read verse 30 with me again. And you, there you go, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all, see, all in your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The word your speaks to the personal application of our love 
for God. In other words, it's not indirect, it's not impersonal, it's not unemotional in our response toward God as our Father, as our Lord, as our God. Our love towards Him is to be very personal because He is our God through His gracious choice. John the Apostle tells us in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, see how great the Father has bestowed. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us. In other words, God gave it. We didn't choose it. He gave it and then we receive it. What is that great love? That we would be called the children of God and such we are. The word your makes it very personal. It's not indirect. It's not unemotional, unpassionate. It's very personal. And the word all speaks directly to the totality of our love for God. Now please understand this. When I say us, when I say we again, I am at the front of the line. But maybe, maybe for us, the word all is more difficult than the word, the word your. I can accept your, but the word all. Some may say that it would be easier to love the Lord your God with some of your heart or with most of your heart. That that would fit better because our hearts, our souls, our mind, our strength are often divided and they're often spent on many different things in life. However, Jesus said we are to love how? With all. With all. All, with all. With what? All, all. How do I respond to this word all? How do we respond to this word all? If you're not here this morning, we have a lot who aren't, and you're watching online. How do we respond to the word all? Are we loving the Lord with all our affection? Are we loving the Lord with all our being? Are we loving the Lord with all of our intellect? Are we loving the Lord with all of our effort, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength? Because in the sacrifice of the cross, as we've seen this morning of, (coughs) Jesus truly fulfilled God's love toward us. May we never forget that God's word of affirmation to His children is the cross. May we never forget how much God loves us. And the way we remember, look back to the cross. That's how much God loves us. Love isn't love if it's only commanded, is it? Did you walk up to your significant other? To your wife? To your spouse? To your fiance? Girlfriend? Boyfriend? Whatever? Did you walk up to them and say, I command you to love me? Any of you ever do that? Nobody? I command you to love me. Love isn't love if it's commanded or only commanded. We can't order anyone to love us. The only way another will love us is if we give love first. Love then becomes a response to love far more than a response to a commandment. Do you see why when Jesus came and he saw the people, they were burdened down because it was more about a love for a commandment than it was a love for a God who had redeemed them and saved them. There's a difference. There's a difference. Love then becomes a response to love more than a response to a commandment. By this we know that He, God, well, 1 John three sixteen, that He laid down His life for us. By this we know love. Why? Because He laid His life down. When we see how deeply God loves us, it should stir a response of love from all of our heart because God gave all for us. I know we've heard that. We've heard that, but can, if we don't guard that, can the Scripture not become just words instead of life? Can it not become just commandment instead of love? If we don't guard it and watch after it in devotion with everything that is within us, 
And when we see how deeply God loves us, it should stir a response of love from all of our heart, from all of our soul, from all of our mind, from all of our strength. In fact, I will say this, what will see us through every difficult, every circumstance in life is not the commandments, it's the love of God. It's the love of God that will see us through. It's the love of God that will keep us true. God's love and our love and devotion to Him. Because when we begin to look at His Word as commandments, when we begin to look at His Word as just do's and don'ts apart from a relationship, it will burn in our hearts down and we will become cold and fickle toward the love of God. But when we understand that these commandments are God's love imparted to us because He says, if you will do what I say, you will open up your life to my love and the life that i got to give to you. It will strengthen us. It will encourage us. It will build our faith instead of destroy it. Along with the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. There's three parts here, and I'm moving fast. I'm trying to. Along with the Shema, the Lord your God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Jesus connects our love for God. There's a direct connection with our love for God, with our love for one another. And it connects it from Leviticus 19, 18. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In fact, we can say very confidently that the greatest indicator that we are growing in our relationship with God is found in our willingness to love. Love. But the world has a definition of love that is not of God. Love is not an emotion. You say, well, yeah, when I love, there's an emotion. Yes, there is, love, there is emotion in love, but love is not an emotion. It's not an emotion. Why? Because the Word tells us God is what? Love. God's not an emotion. Stop seeking an emotion. Start seeking Him. Stop seeking an emotion. Seek Him. Because God is love. Love is not just something He does. It's who. It's what He is. When we talk about agape in the New Testament, that was a word that was not used in the Greek very often. So when they were trying to separate the New Testament writers, they're trying to separate the understanding that love in this world versus because we know there's three different words uh, for love in the Greek language. They use this word agape because love is not an emotion. Love is a person. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So therefore it makes sense that we are never more like our Heavenly Father than when we do what? Agape. Agape. Love. We are able to love because God lives within us and the way in which we love is a clear indicator of who resides in our life. But that's just the second part. The first part is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's where it starts. And out of that proper love for God, we can have proper love for one another, our fellow man. Love your neighbor as yourself. But there's a third part that we often leave out when we look at this scripture. And that is the question of, how do we love ourselves? You shall love your neighbor as what? Yourself. How do we love ourselves? How do we love ourselves? Jesus is talking about a right love for God and a right love for others. But he also is addressing a right love for self. We're not talking about a self-centered, selfish type of love that just looks to me, 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 me. That's not what he's speaking of. 
He's talking about a servant love. Scripture teaches about a healthy, God-honoring love for self. Scripture teaches that. We may have a hard time loving ourselves. Because we still listen to the replay of words of others that have been drummed into our minds. Words with hard edges that cut to this very day. Words like you're stupid, you're clumsy, you're lazy. Jesus is clearly telling us that we will never love others better than we love ourselves. We're to have a proper love for God, a proper love for others that flows out of a proper love for self in the Lord. If we have poor self-love, then that poverty of spirit, now hear what I'm saying there, hear what the Word of God is saying, not what I'm saying. If we have a poor love, then that poverty of spirit will impact how we relate to others. God has not given us a poverty of spirit. Not an impoverished spirit. He has given us a spirit of what? Power. His dunamis. And what? His agape. His love that brings what? A sound mind. Self-discipline. Again, Jesus is not speaking of a narcissistic or ego-centered love. And notice how Jesus sums this up when he talks about these three avenues. Number one, proper love for God. Number two, proper love for others. And number three, proper love for ourselves. That all hinge from the first. Amen? It all hinges from the first. The most essential. And then he says this to the scribe. He says, there is no greater commandment than this. So we are looking to the book of Acts and praying that the Word of God come alive to us anew and afresh. It come alive to us so that it may be alive in us, so that it may be alive through us. All three stages. Alive to us, alive in us, alive through us. And as we look to this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is as the first, love your neighbor as yourself. All three phrases, love God, love others, love self. There isn't that proper love in our lives. We cannot fulfill the great commission. If we're not living the great commandment, this is the great commandment. If we're not living the great commandment, we cannot fulfill the great commission. But transversely, if we're not living out the great commandment or the great commission, then how are we fulfilling the great commandment? Because God calls us to share his love. They go hand in hand and we'll ask the worship team to come back up as they're coming back the question that arises and please if you didn't hear anything else I pray that you'll focus in right now whether you're watching on YouTube or you're in the building this morning there are questions that arise from the pages of God's Word to our hearts. The first being the most important. The first being, how do I love God? How do I love God? Please hear me this morning. Can we make an honest assessment right now? How am I loving God? How am I loving God? Am I loving him with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength? What is the important thing to me in life? That when I wake up in the morning, it drives me, it leads me, it directs me, everything flows from it. That's what Jesus is saying. How do I love God? And listen, hang with me just a few more moments. You know the words that Jesus spoke to the church in Ephesus, and I just want to read them with this question as we reflect, how are we loving God? Listen to what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds and your toll and perseverance. Listen, these are good words. 
your deeds, your toll, your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance. These are good words, good things. And have endured for my name's sake. Isn't that good? They're persevering. They're enduring for the name of Christ. And have not grown weary in doing these things. Listen to the good things the Lord is speaking. But then we know in verse 4 what he says. But I have this against you. How, how could there be something wrong when we're doing all these right things, when, when we're working and, and we're exhibiting all these right things? What could possibly be wrong? Jesus says this, you have left your first love. What we do is important, amen? How we do it is important. But the why of what and how is more important. Why do I do the things that I do? Why do I do them the way that I do them? It should flow from my relationship with God, that I'm loving Him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. And when that's proper, I'm able to love others properly. And when that's proper, I'm able to love myself properly. Just as we come to this time of, of closing and we come to the altar, and the reason many people ask, well, why do you give an altar call? In fact, there has been a debate that has been around for some years. They, they, in fact, individuals have said, we don't find that anywhere in the Bible. You don't find where there's an altar call or we're supposed to give an altar call in the Bible. But the fact of the matter is the Word of God always calls for a response of faith from its hearers. And the question is, how do we need to respond? How do I need to respond? How do you need to respond? You that are watching on YouTube this morning, how do you need to respond to these questions? How I love God. How I love my neighbor and how am I loving myself? Am I loving God with everything that is within me? And the proof of that is in how I love others? Am I loving myself the way that I need to love myself and the way that the Word of God tells me that I need to? We cannot have agape to be healthy in us if we don't have healthy love for ourselves. Not a self-centered love, but a selfless love that walks in the confidence of God's grace. How do we answer these questions this morning? Father, Lord, we come before you now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, lead us. Holy Spirit, lead us to answer these questions that the Word, God's Word, asks of us this morning. Holy Spirit, stir us. Holy Spirit, draw us. Lord, move. Lord, move this morning. Lord, in our hearts, in our lives, move this morning. Are you loving the Lord with everything that is within you? Are you loving God with everything? Or is your love for Him grown cold? Maybe it's because of circumstances, whatever. There's many reasons. But those aren't important. What's important is if I'm not loving Him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength, then my love for God is not where it needs to be. And the Lord would reach out this morning in His love to draw you that He may draw you close and embrace you? Are you loving others in the way the Lord says maybe our love for others is not what it needs to be that we're not sharing the love of God that is within our hearts? In fact, it's impossible for us to love our neighbor if we're not loving God with everything that is within us. 
We can become impatient. We can become uncaring. We can become judging because we're not loving God with everything that is within us so that we can love our neighbor. And the third one is because we love ourselves with God's love. I just want to open the altars this morning. I just want to open the altars this morning that we can come to the Lord. And if we need to adjust, not us, but the Lord to adjust either of those three questions. Proper love for Him, proper love for others, or proper love for self. As they begin to sing, would you get up from where you are? Because you're not worried about anybody else. All you're worried about is Him this morning. Would you get up from where you are? Would you come and allow the Lord to embrace you and allow the Lord to draw you and to speak into your heart this morning? As they begin to sing, just come now. Just come now. Whether you need to pray about love for God, love for others, or love for self, just come now.